which transcends the physical. Okay. And the, part of the, the challenge with this premiere, the paradox, is that so much of what I experience as reality, I have to touch. I have to actually experience. And so that paradox of how we look for those central things which are beyond the physical plane, and yet for me the key to that is what is in the physical plane. It's an interesting paradox for me. Um, and a quick aside for that. So the question is, what is the nature of God? Or the divine mind, the spirit, right? These names we have for divinity, which we really, I really will dig into for the entire message one of these weeks. That's one thing I'm looking forward to doing with you all. Um, but what is the nature of humanity? What is the nature of, of, of reality, if you will? And what's the nature of the relationship of humanity to nature? Right? Those are some of the basic questions we ask. And I think that, or actually, the relationship of humanity and beauty, if you will, is one of the terms I've been embracing lately. And if, if time is only linear, when we think about unity and the explorations of, of these questions, we might assume that we're moving away um, from the limited thinking of our forebears, like, like we're rejecting that that we inherit. And my sense is, however, um, that if we think about time in a cyclical way, which is a little bit of a challenge with new thought, because new thought is so much about progress, but again, if you think about time as a secular, and a tr turning in a circle, for me, it helps me understand the tradition in a new way. So when visiting, revisiting the past, we also come to an understanding of the truth in our current time. Okay, if you see that as a cycle, it's a cycle moving back and forth. I have a quote for you. I always have a quote for you. Mm -hmm. um, and this is from uh, Hel Helena Norberg Hodge, a conversation she had with Wendell Berry. Um, great piece. If you don't know these people, are, I should probably tell you. So she is a uh, the founder and director of Local Futures. She wrote a book called Ancient Futures, which is that paradox, one of those paradoxes that I have really embraced. But then Wendell Berry, if you don't know, is a great essayist, poet, novelist, Kentucky farmer, a real visionary. And uh, they capture some of this sense of both the ancient and the current, if you will. Here's what she says. What I've seen in ancient traditional cultures is that even the language reminded people that their experiential knowledge was really the only reliable knowledge you could experience. One of the great tragedies has been the shift towards trusting secondhand knowledge more than we trust experiential knowledge, and in fact at times denigrating experiential knowledge as anecdotal and worthless. And of course this is being reinforced by numerical or reductionist modern science. We talk about the medieval mind sometimes in here, which is modern science where we have a tendency to reduce things like that. And Barry replies, I think what you're applying there is the fundamental rule of all human disciplines. And that rule is that you have to know what you're talking about. You have to come with evidence. And this applies across the board, from the court of law to the laboratory of the scientist. You have to know what you're talking about. It has to be experiential. And I would say for the theologian, for the philosopher, and the metaphysicist as well, that you have to experience what it is you're talking about. So one aspect of unity, this tradition as I understand it, is a reinterpretation of sacred works well, centrally Christian scriptures, but also, in my mind, the Hebrew Bible, um, with an overlay of some basic unity principles. And so we revisit, we do turn in a circle. Um, but I have to say that I am, as we come upon the Easter season, I am like Thomas, if you know that story. You know, we often talk about doubting Thomases, right? So in the, in, the, in the story that we hear in the Gospel, when Jesus of Nazareth um, is, has been proclaimed that he's risen physically, arisen from the dead, and people are all excited, they're scared, or whatever they were. But Thomas said, wait a second, I don't believe it. Right? Remember that story? Until I can place my hands in the hole in his side, I won't believe that he's back. All right? And I know we kind of denigrate Thomas for that a little bit, but I have to tell you, I embrace Thomas for that. Because I think that's part of who I am, too. And by the way, I have to tell you, because you all appreciate me how you provide this, I was trying to look up that story at home, and of course I left my Bible here. Because there wasn't one here. <laughs> I, had, I couldn't actually look it up. So you have to trust me on the story. You'll tell me if I was wrong. So again, for me, as we think about the idea of metaphysics, the idea of that which transcends the physical realm, to me the key remains, what can I touch? What can I experience right in front of me as a key to that transcendent realm, if you will? So we'll talk a little bit about distillation. You know, distillation in the chemistry, right? You sort of boil things down to through their base elements. It's a means by which we come to some of these um, basic understandings. So this is a shameless plug for the class this week. Those of you who are still interested, um, we're doing the class on the five principles of unity. And that's what those are. 
there and attempt by, um, actually it's Fillmore's great granddaughter who wrote the book that we're we'll using. Um, no, excuse me, she came up with the principles. It's another one who wrote the book. Um, but it's really this attempt to say, as you look across disciplines, spiritual disciplines across the world, what are some basic things that we really share, that we really find? Um, and that's kind of where those five principles come from. And uh, the, the dictionary said that what you do is you heat something to separate the more volatile from the less volatile to create something that's nearly pure or a refined substance. So if you want an image of that, I was when I was in Columbus, south of my brother's house, the near north is an area in Columbus where the hipsters hang out. We're really fun to make fun of. If I could grow my beard longer and was 30 years younger, I could probably be a hipster myself since I wear flannel shirts a lot. But the, um, we went into this coffee shop because my partner likes fancy coffee drinks. But it was a hipster place, and um, the coffee you had to wait like a day for. It was literally hanging on the wall, dripping slowly through tubes um, into this tiny little cup. Um, so that was distillation, right? Um, the other example I think of is peeling an onion. That you take these beliefs that are out there and you say, what's the core? What's the core belief here? Um, to get at reality, to get at divinity. And within this tradition, we inherit, you inherit, I inherit, where this has taken place um, has been that exploration of the intersection between Judaism and Christianity. Um, particularly in light of the lines credited to Jesus of Nazareth, the historical Jesus, that said the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, is right now, is in it all of us. That's where we get some of this unity principle about divinity being in each of us, right? This, this statement by, the, um, by Jesus. And within this understanding is this realm, this realm of divinity, this beauty, if you would, is not just a little bit in each of us, right? But it's complete in each of us. And it's complete in each of us. Not a partial expression of divinity, not just a little chunk that's been peeled off, but it's complete in every single one of us. And that expression is in us in our entirety. Not just a little piece. Now that's a great gift, right? That's a rich gift. But I would also argue that it's a supremely heavy responsibility. It's both. That's what we have to embrace, both of those pieces of this. Right? If we're gonna believe this idea that the divine is whole and complete in every single one of us, that's a great gift. And yet it also calls, calls to us, doesn't it? It's a challenge. It's a great challenge for all of us. It certainly is for me. So where does this, this exploration of that which is beyond the pale, um, where does that come to a head for me? It comes to a head in community. It comes to a head in community. And I think this is uh, this distillation, if you would, of our core beliefs um, can become way too esoteric if we can't touch it and see it and feel it, for me anyway. Um, and to be honest here, uh, you have someone in front of you Feel like I'm constantly letting you know who I am here a little bit, who's very skeptical about things that I can't touch or see. Okay? And I'll tell you about my friend Merlin. Merlin Smith is a good friend and mentor of mine, campus pastor uh, for years on the West Coast, also here in Minneapolis. He's passed away now. But he and I used to have late night philosophical conversations, sometimes with a cigar, sometimes with some whiskey, I will confess. <laughs> um, we got in trouble with that a couple of times. That's a story you don't care about. But anyway, we used to try to distinguish between being a skeptic and being skeptical. I want to clarify that because I think being a skeptic is problematic. Being a skeptic is actually a, a, a person within the Greek philosophical tradition. I looked this up too. And the, a skeptic is someone who denied the possibility of real knowledge of any kind. So a complete denial of any kind of knowledge. Just said, nope, there's just no way. We can't land there. Versus being skeptical simply means that you're not easily persuaded or convinced, and that you doubt the fundamental doctrines of religion. So I'm skeptical, friends. Um, I've told you I wrestle with these concepts, but I, I think that's a good distinction for me. And I think that in a community, um, a strong, healthy faith community, that being skeptical is one of the things that helps us grow. Some of you know I worked in campus ministry for years, and one of the things that I really embraced in that work was the idea of faith development. The idea that there is a path that people actually develop in their faith. And sometimes I would work with parents who were concerned about their children coming to the university because in some ways the world exploded for them, right? And, and so their, their life was suddenly, they were questioning all the things they were raised with. And I would try to help them understand that a mature faith is the one that does challenge what we were raised with and then comes out the other side, right? That's a mature faith. 
And that requires a fair, healthy dose of skepticism, in my, in my experience, and also in my opinion. And while we're doing that, we have to be kind to them. Right? That's part of the balance. That's part of the balance. If we're, gonna, if we're gonna disagree, I think we have to be kind with one another as well. But that challenge for me is the balance of this grounding in reality. The lived experience of a community is one of the ways in which I then can suddenly find and experience and see some of what more esoteric beliefs might be. But for me, it has to be grounded in space with people, with human beings. And this community, for me, by the way, it's, it's interesting for me because sort of the, um, I always think about what my work is here. Part of it's administration, which is not the sexy part of my job, right? Um, it's sort of that's just, it's just not, not that anything I do is very sexy anymore. But anyway, the, the job part, that's not the sexy part of the job. But as, as I've been engaging with Unity, again, to, I can be personal about this for another moment. Um, one of the interesting things about looking at the ordination process within Unity is it's actually very heavily centrally controlled out of Kansas City. I, I was really surprised by that, to be honest. Because, uh, there's, other, there's other traditions that do it differently. There's a spectrum. So the far end of the spectrum would be um, some of our Baptist brothers and sisters, where really if the individual feels the call, then they are ordained in that tradition. There's, there's such a respect for that individual response. Um, and I come from some traditions which is really more of a middle ground where it's actually owned by the local community, which I'm really attracted to, right? So there's a sense of the central understanding, the education, the understanding of what are central tenets, if you will, or tenets, I think Rose we decided last night it's called, um, the, of, of beliefs, right? That that's very important. And also the individual sense of calling, those of you who are raised Lutheran like I am know what that means, the idea of a calling. But then if it's not grounded in community, it has no meaning. It has no meaning or purpose. If that calling, if you're, if, in my opinion, is not grounded. And this is why for me, part of that grounding, when I think about mysticism or I think about that which transcends, the voices which are most um, relevant or most hit my heart are the ones that aren't grounded in a tradition. So I, as some of you know, I've talked about this, some of the Roman Catholic mystics I'm most intrigued by because they're still grounded within this rich tradition. And Richard Rohr, who I've been encouraged by, I wanted you to read more lately, a Franciscan uh, monk, and yet he's very esoteric in some of his experience of the divine, but he's grounded within a tradition that's anything but that. I find that intriguing as a balance. And it's a paradox. That idea that that which is most real, which is outside of our physical realm, might also be the key is most in what we experience here. And where does that community happen for us? Um, one, for me, as you know, is in nature. Our engagement with the natural world is one of those places where we sense the divine, our understanding of. In the community at large, and none of you have really talked with me about this, which I've been so tickled with, the idea of whether it's food for kids. We did one Sunday afternoon, and most people have been talking about whether we house um, homeless here as part of the churches that do that in our community. But how do we engage with the community is another place where I would suggest we are most able to sense the divine and that which is outside of this physical realm. And then in our intentional faith communities of faith, like the ones we have here as well. It's not always easy. It's messy. Community is messy. Um, I would suggest the esoteric is also messy. Um, but it's, it's uh, the way it is. Just the way it is. So in circular fashion, again, I want to come back to something about our work and quote uh, Ursula Le Guin, who I've quoted in here before. And what she said is that it's good to have an end to journey towards, but it's the journey that matters in the end. Right? It's how we are today, right? This is that unity piece about the now, living in the now, being present with one another right now. And what is our journey? Well, part of it is our metaphysical ponderings of the fundamental nature of reality, of divinity, right? of the natural world, the fundamental nature of that. And the truth is that the journey is right here and right now. And this, this is the space that we most can embrace, understand, and be embraced by today. And so it is.
space for you where you might sense sense the divine. So if you take a moment to make sure your feet are nice and flat on the ground. Relax those shoulders if you can. And breathe in nice and slow on the in-breath. And out deep. Really empty that cavity.
Legislature and the PSU.